It's great to see such a terrific turnout at this conference. I think this is a very significant uh, moment, really, in the history of uh, Australia's uh, activism. I normally can't talk without PowerPoint, so I'm going to uh, rely on some notes that I've made, and I'll just start reading them and do it as informally as I can. Look, to begin with uh, some context, um, in a secret report obtained by the Electronic Intifada, uh, key Israel lobby groups have conceded recently that they've failed to counter the Palestine solidarity movement. I think this was very interesting. And this is despite vastly increasing their spending 20-fold over the last six years or so. And despite tens of millions of dollars, they report that the results remain elusive. This is very significant for us in the light of the efforts that they're making. Now, as our own experience here with the Israel lobby has shown, they just don't get it. I think they don't really understand uh, what uh, they have and what we have. Um, what we have and all their money can't buy and all their resources that they have by comparison with us is, of course, we have the truth and we have justice and we have uh, human rights and decency on our side and they can't compete with that. And I think that's what's having an effect in the public increasingly. So I think that's why all their money is not having the results they want. Now, we see the consequences of this in what is perhaps the most striking fact about BDS, which is the contrast between its innocuousness as an act of conscience, a rights-based peaceful political protest on the one hand, and the extraordinary extreme severity and the outrageousness of the Zionist reactions to it on the other. I'll use Zionist as a shorthand for the pro-Israel lobby and, and other opposition. The extraordinary reactions to BDS and, uh, and, and uh, uh, pro-Palestine support generally is, is what I want to really talk about. So, for example, BDS is characterised as delegitimizing and even destroying Israel and undermining the very existence of the Jewish state. The president of Israel, Reuven Rivlin, described the worldwide BDS movement as a serious strategic threat, I think second only to Iran. And Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs has allocated a budget approaching $30 million for a secretive anti-BDS task force. Uh, the most recent overreaction of this kind um, is, uh, uh, as Yusuf mentioned earlier, the draconian anti-BDS legislation in the United States Congress, which is threatening to make support of BDS a federal crime. This is an extraordinary response to peaceful expression of, of free speech. The bill, the Anti-Boycott Act, S-720, is so egregious that it's prompted the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, to intervene with a letter to members of the US Senate, urging them to oppose it on the grounds that the legislation would violate the free speech protections in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Now, these are the kinds of egregious reactions, the tactics of fighting BDS, that are a symptom of a kind of perversity that it's important to understand and that I want to talk about. Now, of course, the problems confronting BDS are part of the wider problem facing criticism of Israel in general. Chomsky has famously written about the uh, attempts to control our, or the attempts of control in our democratic liberal society with a free press. He referred to this as the manufacture of consent. However, with Zionism, we confront not only widespread ignorance and bias of the sort that Chomsky talked about in the mainstream media and in the intellectual culture about 1948 and everything since. Even when the facts are known, there's a further psychological mechanism that I want to discuss that's designed to distort and deflect the realities. Here we see something quite different that may be aptly referred to, I like to say, a manufacture of stupidity, which is quite different and it's really the theme of what I want to talk about. This is the acceptance of absurd, extreme notions like the well-known Orwellian satire of uh, Newspeak and Doublethink, but perhaps even surpassing Orwell's examples of war is peace and freedom is slavery and ignorance is strength. The Zionist cases are so absurd as to be comical in a grim kind of way, but these are real examples, unlike Orwell's, and uh, they're remarkably effective, and I think it's very important for us to understand how this works, and I'll give some illustrations as I go through, but I'll give a kind of a list at the end, quickly, a kind of a potted summary of these mechanisms of this uh, manufacture of stupidity. So for a central example, on the one hand, familiar to, to all of us, BDS pr promotes human rights and international law explicitly opposing racism in all its forms, including anti-Semitism. But of course, the BDS movement is frequently compared to the Nazi campaign 
against Jewish shops in the 1930s, whose notorious slogan was, in German, Kauft nicht bei Juden, which means don't buy from Jews. And also the slogan on the posters in the 30s was, die Juden sind unser Unglück, Jews are our misfortune. This is what BDS is compared to, the Nazi campaign. This is so crazy that it tells you something about the psychology and the distortions, uh, the, the perversity of the opposition that we're facing. This disgraceful slander, of course, is made regularly, despite the fact that the principal targets of BDS, as we all know, have been non-Jewish, non-Israeli organizations profiting from the occupation. Nevertheless, the Nazi slur is promoted by Jewish organizations and their leaders, and it's been regularly echoed by politicians, including Australia's Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop. France's Prime Minister, Emmanuel Macron, recently expressed his opposition to BDS as a form of anti-Semitism, and recently said during a visit with Netanyahu, that we will not surrender to anti-Zionism because it's a reinvention of anti-Semitism. This is crazy because it's taken so seriously when it's so without foundation. Now, of course, the anti-Semitism charge is more generally applied to any criticism of Israel, not just the BDS. The former Israeli government minister was very candid about this in a TV clip that you can see on uh, Democracy Now. She said candidly, the charge is a trick that is always used to deflect criticism of Israel. And she had no illusions about what we understand very well. For example, the United Kingdom rabbi Jonathan Sachs said, anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism. It's the blood libel of our time. So this is very common. It's interesting that the resort to this slander has not diminished despite repeated exposure. It doesn't matter how many times one says what I'm saying or you expose the absurdity of it. There's a certain perverse logic, however, to this persistent tactic because it serves two very useful purposes for the Zionist cause. On the one hand, it diverts attention from the facts, which I'm going to talk about, and it also wastes victims' time, the, the time and effort, in defending pointlessly against this charge, uh, attempting to refute the charge. It's evident, of course, that criticism of Israel is not inherently anti-Jewish. However, by insisting that Israel is a Jewish state that acts on behalf of all Jews, it makes critics of Israel anti-Semitic by definition. That's why it works. It's kind of just uh, a truism. Now, lobby groups here in Australia, such as the Executive Council of Australian Jewry, insist upon identifying Israel as a Jewish state, as Israel wants, and they defend its crimes, on the one hand by silence, when uh, Israel commits its crimes, and also by slandering any uh, dissenting voices in the Jewish community or elsewhere. Now, of course, in the light of that, it's hardly surprising if some others fail to make the distinction clearly between Jews and Zionism. Again, a British rabbi, uh, declared, the chief rabbi declared, that Zionism is a noble and integral part of Judaism. And then you beat up people for failing to make the distinction clearly. Well, that's uh, a, a trick that we... Uh, the amazing point that I wanted to make was it's a wonder that so few people, in fact, do conflate their criticism of Israel with, uh, uh, with, with the criticism of Jews. At the rallies in Sydney for Gaza, every week when the rally was held for five weeks, they made a point of making the distinction very explicit. And that was very significant, and I commented on that at the time. So it's remarkable how clearly uh, uh, the pro-Palestine uh, advocacy understands that distinction, despite the efforts to, to obscure it. So regardless of any personal qualities that someone may have, attitudes or beliefs, criticism of Israel is, in fact, the sole sufficient criterion for the accusation of anti-Semitism. Jews themselves, of course, are not exempt from this charge, which in their case is justified by this absurd categorization of self-hating. This is an interesting, also not a an insignificant charge. It's a kind of a pseudo-psychological diagnosis of a kind of mental disorder uh, for which the only symptom is, of course, criticism of Israel. But it's very similar to the former Soviet Union when any dissenter was sent to a psychiatric hospital. And the reason was that since the Soviet system is perfect, if anybody dissented, they had to be crazy. So this is the kind of logic in, in, in attacking uh, self-hating Jews. And it, the importance of this is that with this kind of tactic, they confer, the Zionists confer an undeserved respectability on real anti-Semites, real Jew haters, by failing to distinguish them from advocates of justice and human rights. Recently, Netanyahu gave open encouragement to actual real anti-Semites um, when he was in Hungary, and, it, and in fact endorsing the Hungarian government's racist campaign against George Soros and the thinly disguised anti-Semitism of that campaign, He's a prominent critic of Israel, so he doesn't count. His Jewishness doesn't matter. And uh, predictably, groups like the Executive Council of Australian Jewry, they're sensitive to any slight or great 
uh, anti-Semitism anywhere in the world, they remain silent about those egregious public cases. Um, in Hungary, you may have seen the posters. There were pictures of Soros by the government, but they were daubed with graffiti in Hungarian saying, stinking Jew. Well, you know, the Executive Council of Australian Jewry, who's so sensitive to anti-Semitism, as far as I know, didn't say anything. So in this way, of course, uh, the, the Zionist organisations dishonour the victims of the Holocaust. They pretend to stand for, and they pervert the lessons to be learned. Indeed, I think, uh, given my background, I take the lessons of the Holocaust to be among the reasons to support BDS. And of course, Jews themselves understand this perfectly well. I've often mentioned this. When I was growing up in the 1950s, in the aftermath of World War II, it was common amongst Jews that we shouldn't buy Volkswagens. Of course, the joke was, uh, Mercedes-Benz is OK. <laughs> if you want to explain, to take an analogy, if you want to explain why, for example, I might be angry with somebody, it might be thought misleading if you didn't mention that they burgled my house, they stole my car, and they kidnapped the kids and shot the dog. For the same reason, it might be thought misleading, not to mention that BDS activists have good grounds for protest against Israel besides anti-Semitism. However, we see the resort to anti-Semitism and the Nazi smear against BDS in interesting ways. And one of the most egregious examples is a recent book by two Australian academics, Philip Mendes and Nick Dyrenfurth. They play this trick. The book is called Why Boycotting Israel is Wrong. The tactic of Mendes and Dyrenfurth is not what is actually said, which is bad enough, but rather, of course, what is carefully omitted. In 200 pages concerned with BDS and advocates, there's no entry in the index for occupation, no hint of the facts on the ground, as we call them, that might conceivably explain the motivation of BDS supporters uh, besides their Jew hatred. Of course, if you leave out all of the relevant reasons they might have, uh, it looks more plausible. I won't go through them in other talks, in other audiences. I'll list some of the facts which we all in this place would know very well, but it's horrible enough. And not mentioning a single one of the deaths and the house demolitions and all that, of course, what else could explain why people boycott Israel except they're anti-Semitic? As, as an example, of, one of the examples of the manufacture of stupidity um, that they're guilty of as well, a viable Palestinian state, of course, has been destroyed by Israel in, and in keeping with the liquid charter, government leaders, actually from the very earliest, going back to Ben-Gurion and even Herzl, they declare that there never will be a Palestinian state, but Mendes and Dyrenfurth claim that it's the peaceful BDS movement that's trying to annihilate Israel by means of a kind of war, they use language like that, and the collective punishment of Israelis. George Orwell would be impressed by this kind of newspeak and, and, and reversal of the truth. Now, of course, since it's no longer possible to deny the immense and horrifying realities of the 70-year Nakba and the brutal 50-year military occupation, we see these two correlated and shameful tactics. On the one hand, a scrupulous silence about the crimes of the Jewish state, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a resort to vilification of critics on the other. In the vernacular, as we say, it's not a good look. Foremost among culpable community organisations, here anyway, is the peak representative Jewish body I've mentioned, the Executive Council of Australian Jewry. This is not a Zionist organisation, at least in its name, it's a Jewish organisation which is significant. And in their publications by their officials, uh, their director, Peter Wertheim, and the public relations officer, Alex Rifkin, and Julie Nathan, who writes for them, they resort to extraordinary deceit and defamation on behalf of their constituency in their subordination, subser subservience to the uh, Jewish state. It's an interesting case study to look at their stuff, which I'll talk about briefly. Among the targets for such character assassination have been former ABC producer, Kathy Peters, who's here among us, um, of course, uh, Green's uh, uh, MP Senator, the admirable, heroic uh, Lee Rhiannon, has been accused of making all sorts of terrible, uh, allegedly terrible things, vitriolic, hateful speech, and her pathological, I'm quoting, pathological aversion to the Jewish state and so on. These are disgraceful slurs, which they publish regularly. Um, I won't go on in detail. Um, uh, about these examples, but I'll mention a couple of other cases. These tactics were exposed in a letter I wrote to the um, Canberra Times in November 2014, in which I was responding to an article by Rifkin and the ECAG director, Peter Wertheim. Besides smearing Jewish supporters of Palestine, including myself, they denounced the other significant and admirable uh, 
former Labour MP Melissa Park, for supporting the BDS movement in particular. Now, my letter was published in the uh, Canberra Times with the heading, quoting my words, a disgraceful descent into the gutter. It didn't, of course, stop them, and it's interesting what happened subsequently. Rifkin's dirt file, they keep a dirt file, which they've pulled out when we visit Canberra to send to all the MPs to warn against us, um, and APAN in particular, which I'm proud to be a member of. And the dirt file has been repeatedly used to smear, smear members of APAN, and not deterred by earlier public expose of their tactics. And recently, ECADs repeated their character assassination in their report on anti-Semitism and an article which was published by the ABC. I mention this because uh, after legal threats, these were modified. They withdrew, uh, deleted the offensive uh, references um, to members of APAN executive. And, and I'll quote their original statement. Uh, APAN was included among, quote, those dozens of Israeli groups who are, quote, cesspits of consistent and frequent Nazi-style anti-Jewish propaganda. And in, in, in this report we read, before they removed it, even the anti-Israel lobby uh, the group, the APAN, composed of Christian clergy, academics and others, has not been immune to the virus of anti-Semitism. Now, that's a reference to specific people um, in APAN, which you will know. And they had to remove that. This is telling you the game that they play because... I mean, if, the, if they had anything else other than smears, then uh, they wouldn't have to resort to this kind of tactics. I'll, I'll just say a couple of other things as I try to wind up. The ECAD's report on anti-Semitism, of course, gives the impression that Australia, like the rest of the world, is awash in the traditional prejudice of, and racist hatred. But I think this record can't be accepted at face value. Acknowledging a certain incidence of anti-Semitism, it's important to understand the likely causes today. And I say today because it's an unquestioned widespread assumption among pro-Israel apologists that the principal cause of anti-Semitism today is the same traditional race hatred of Jews seen as Christ killers controlling the banks, greed and all the usual stuff uh, long before. And of course they always point out, misleadingly, that well anti-Semitism was around long before the State of Israel existed, as if that's relevant and as if the State of Israel is not relevant to today's anti-Semitism, insofar as there is any. Um, and it wouldn't be surprising. And of course they report going back to the Crusades and the French Revolution. Now, I'll skip ahead of my notes a little bit. Of course there's been a worldwide uh, campaign of this sort in England against Corbyn um, to, in, in the Labour Party in the UK, the same smear tactics that were unfounded to try to destroy Corbyn and, and uh, pro-Palestine supporters in the Labour Party there. Perhaps I'll get to just a few examples, I've got a couple of minutes left, um, of the manufacturer's stupidity. In fact, a version of this, not under that title, is on the website. If you look up um, pro-Palestine activists, including um, Anna Balzer and, and others, uh, have a website you may have seen called Shit Zionists Say. And uh, I can quote some of those, and I've got a whole long list of examples of my own. I might try and mention one or two, but they think, say, think it's a parody, it's a mock of... of, of the, the Israeli defensiveness and Jewish def defensiveness, they say in a mocking tone, I don't feel safe. And they say it's very complicated to somebody, an Israeli with their f foot on a Palestinian's neck. Uh, and they say Palestinians are an invented people, unlike the Israelis. Palestinians don't exist and they want to kill us. These are all jokes, but there's a serious point and one can't help laughing, but of course this has a deep insight. Uh, why is everybody singling out Israel? I've been to Israel and the Arabs love it there. People need to stand with Israel and stop being so one-sided. And so it goes on. Well, they're not merely funny. They, they deserve to be taken seriously as a kind of a catechism or doctrinal manual for pro-Israel apologetics. Let me end by a couple of examples. In Dublin, little yellow stickers appeared in supermarkets uh, against certain products that were from Israel from the West Bank and the uh, that yellow stickers with some writing on it. The Israeli government declared this anti-Semitic because you remember the Star of David that Jews had to wear was yellow. Well, excuse me, so people started making jokes that, you know, Big Bird from Sesame Street is anti-Semitic. Anything yellow is anti -Semitic. Now, we can't help laughing, but the absurdity tells you something about the psychology. Uh, let me give you a couple of other examples. Well, one of them is, uh, perhaps I'll end on this one. I've got a whole list of them. A common claim is, well, you know, the Palestinians are always rejecting the two-state solution. Why did they reject the two-state solution in 1947? Excuse me? The United Nations took half the country, 
there was, you know, a Nakba and a dispossession of the Palestine and the demolition of 500 religions. That's the two-state solution the Palestinians should have accepted. This is deranged. This is a kind of clinical psychopathology, but it's so common that you have to understand how this works. So the background for this is that this is a claim that Israel and the Jews deserve some kind of self-determination. And it's a reversal, of course, of the, the agenda uh, that is the real uh, cause for self-determination, which is justice and, and, and the Palestinians' right uh, according to international law. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. So I, um, to begin with, I, I do agree with uh, previous speakers that we should uh, apologize if we are going to sound academic. So apologies. To frame the conversation, uh, I'll be engaging in historical analysis. And I would like to start with uh, literature, Lebanese literature. In his 1998 novel, Bab el-Shams, or in English, The Gate of the Sun, the Lebanese author Elias Huri collated stories and tales about the Nakba that he gathered from refugee camps in southern Lebanon. Among the main characters in the novel, Yunus, a former Palestinian fighter who crosses back and forth the northern border between the Galilee and Lebanon, hides in a cave named Babel Shams. There at the cave, he is visited by his wife, Nahili. In one of their meetings, Nahili tells Yunus about the cries and moans she had heard coming from the Moshav Hachiyud the Yemeni Jews had built over El Birwe, and about the mysterious rumors of Yemeni children dying and disappearing. She tells Yunus that the Yemeni Jewish women would go out into the fields and lament like Arab women, and that she started to fear for her own children. She then says to Yunus, if the children of the Jews are disappearing, what will happen to ours? This brief passage from Babel Shams is one more voice, this time coming from the oral histories of Palestinian refugees, that adds to the increasing volume of evidence supporting the accusations of institutional kidnappings of Yemeni babies and children by Israeli officials during the 1950s and the 1960s. Undeniably, this was the most atrocious of all the supremacist practices that the Jewish white Ashkenazim had carried out against the Yemeni community before and after 1948. Crucially, the Yemeni children affair is not to be seen as an isolated, isolated episode, but as typical of the cultural attitude of the Ashkenazi Zionist towards the Oriental Jews, the Mizrahim, in modern times. An attitude that began its course with the arrival of the European Ashkenazi Jew to Palestine from late 19th century to colonize the country. At the core of this white attitude towards the Mizrahim lie the cultural repulsion towards the Arabs in general. We must remember, though most of the Jews that had arrived to Palestine in a colonizatory mission between late 19th century and early 20th century were mostly poor and politically motivated by centuries of anti-Semitism, these Jews were European. For them, the Orient was backward and in need of salvation. Therefore, Arabs and their culture were racialized as an external category to the Zionist colonial project in a similar fashion to the ways other settler colonies shaped the relation between settlers and natives. If the Zionist pioneers differentiated themselves from the Oriental Jews, the Mizrahim, it was because the latter were seen by the former merely as Arabs. To state the obvious, Zionists had not arrived to Palestine to join the native Ottoman Palestinian society, but to create a new society, apart from the native, and eventually to replace them. Zionists had created an entirely new social realm 
in Palestine on the basis of the forces of division that race promotes. The labor market was rationalized as a basis to dispossess Arab workers from their livelihood. Separated education and cultural institutions were created for Jews only. The kibbutz was inaugurated as the culmination of efforts to establish a model of segregated community that merged Jewish land ownership with Jewish-only labor and Jewish-only housing. Even domestic consumption was shaped as another racial frontier, where the question of from whom one purchases bread, cigarettes, flour, meat, and other quotidian products was invested with national significance. By following the axiom that Jews buy only from Jews who have produced their goods on the basis of Jewish labor only, Zionists were engineering racial Jewish enclaves where the natives of Palestine could no longer maintain their traditional ways of lives, including the everyday practices shared by Arabs and Oriental Jews, a reality that was common in Palestine prior to the arrival of the settlers. During Ottoman times, Oriental Jews used to live together with Arabs in the same neighborhoods and at times the same housing compounds. But in contrast, the Zionist settlers offer an alternative, separated housing. While an Arabic-centered multilingualism dominated the social spaces of Ottoman Palestine, Zionism characterized as assimilationist any practice that did not privilege Hebrew and Hebrew language and culture. With the advent of Zionism, it became commonplace to distinguish between workers on a racial basis, a practice that did not exist before. An integral part of this process involved shunting aside the Oriental Jews, who for a long time had been the official representatives and the leadership of the Jewish community in Palestine. A shared cultural milieu formed through centuries, bonded Arabs and Oriental Jews, a milieu that already by early 20th century was being shattered by the new everyday practices of the Zionist settler project. What is more, Zionists saw the Oriental Jews as unsuitable for assuming any significant role in the leadership of the emergent Zionist community in Palestine. Their Arabness was to blame. The physical and cultural proximity of the Oriental Jews to the Arabs of Palestine were seen as the source of the problem, and hence, the loyalty of the Oriental Jews to the Zionist national project was always, always questioned. The point I'm trying to make is that from its inception, Zionism emerged as a purely European project in the sense that it embraced nation and race as the defining dynamics of the promise to liberate the European Jews from centuries of anti-Semitism. In other words, the solution Zionism offered to the Jews and still offers is to secure their existence as a distinct and privileged race away from their original white societies. As I'm trying to explain from its inception, Zionism did never aspire to create a race-free or a multiracial society, and in fact, it retained the racial topography that it shared with anti-Semitism and so to project structurally to another country. Let us dig into this a bit further. As said, Zionism rejected the exile paradigm in favor of a new Jewish subjectivity, a new form of being, a new Jew, a modern and productive Jew. But this new Jew grew within the racialized realities of what is termed the conquest of labor, the conquest of land, and the rejection of the Arab cultural framework of the country, all of which became dominant in the constitution of the Zionist community in Palestine. These forms of being created the life tools of an emerging colonial sovereignty that developed as necessarily separated from native life in all its aspects separated from Arab life and culture in general, 
and separated from Arab Jewish shul life in particular. Structurally speaking, that new Jewish Zionist community, vibrant and productive, grew on the basis of a series of racial divisions and segregations between everything that was European and everything that was Arab, the Mizrahim included. These were the seeds of their polity, which went on to become the pillars of the state of Israel. Now, if Zionism emerged and grew as a racial polity, what does that mean in regards the anti-Semitism they were escaping from? What exactly had Zionism given to European Jewry by colonizing Palestine? My answer is that Zionism did not liberate Jews from the thought of race, nor did it liberate Jews from being an active part in the production, consolidation, and everyday exercise of racial practices. The opposite is in fact the case. As Zionism carried forward into Palestine, the thought and practice of race that lied at the core of anti-Semitism. This is why many scholars believe that first and foremost, Zionism is an European project. Since one cannot get rid of race by basing one's own national selfhood on race, and given that it was a variety of racial politics Jews were escaping from in Europe, the conclusion is that both ideologically and in terms of political praxis, Zionism blocked Jewish modern life from liberating the Jews from anti-Semitism. On a general level, by its very definition and materialization, Zionism reinforced the relevance of race as a practicality of political life. And on a more Jewish internal level, as an Orientalist project, Zionism externalized all Mizrahi Jewish communities. Sadly, for a variety of historical reasons we cannot address now, this did not prevent that most Israeli Mizrahim today in Israel are no different from their Ashkenazi brothers and sisters in their hatred of the Palestinians. As a corollary, as long as Jewish social and political sovereign life depends on race and racialization for its existence, Israeli Jews have no moral right to speak on behalf of the Jewish people against anti-Semitism. It is precisely because of the fact that Israel was built as a Jewish ex exclusivist society that Israelis have no right to pretend to be the global protectors of the Jews. When the Aretz newspaper claims in its editorial of July the 13th this year, and I quote, that Israel sides with anti-Semites because of Netanyahu's dealing with the Hungarian government, inadvertently Aretz is pointing to the historical connections that made Israel what it is. As Peter commented before, in the Hungarian case, the Israeli government sided with the nationalistic, racist, and Islamophobic campaign of the ruling party Fidesz that are attacking Hungarian-born Jewish tycoon George Soros. Soros is accused of supporting BDS and civil society organizations for human rights, and hence Israel prefers to ignore the anti-Semitic campaign in Hungary for the sake of protecting Israel's own politics of race. Days before the Israeli Prime Minister visited Hungary, the local Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, praised the Hungarian ruler who collaborated with the Nazis, under whom half a million of Hungarian Jews were sent to the death camps. Remember, not long ago, Prime Minister Netanyahu claimed that the Nazis did not really mean to do it, and if they did it, it was because of the influence of the then Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini, a senior Palestinian figure. These sort of allegations make sense only if one voids the Holocaust from its fundamental cause, race. This is how Zionist reasoning finally finds itself where it belongs within the camp of the Holocaust deniers. Zionism's logical conclusion is to side with those who promote nationalism and xenophobia, 
even if they are anti-Semites. This political preference, preferences on the part of the Israeli prime minister might sound extreme, and some, like the liberal Zionist editors of Haaretz, would like to attribute them to Netanyahu's ultra-right-wing government. But as I briefly tried to expose here, the logic and practicalities of the political community that the Zionists had built in Palestine were founded on race, and in fact, the political movement that established that community, and later on the state of Israel, was not the right-wing revisionist movement, but the labor. The Zionist heart find it's easy to attend to race, to explain things related to social life. It is an ingrained reflex formed over more than a century. For Israeli Jews, race is the most available emotional and cognitive resource to form a sentiment about life and people in general. This is not a problem of certain individuals in the Israeli Jewish society, but a collective common sense. Therefore, the Jewish state is not and cannot pretend to be a protector of Jews. Antisemitism is in its agenda only if it can be summoned to defame the political practice of organizations, particularly if these organizations are Palestinian. To conclude, there are at least two ways to refute the vulgar claim that VDS is anti-Semitic. One is by focusing on BDS itself as a form of anti-colonial campaign as it is. In this choice, one has to focus on the deeds of the colonialists, in so doing, making redundant the relevance of their race. The way I choose today is different. I focus on the historical reasons that help us to question Israel's right to stand as a paladin against anti-Semitism. Let me end these notes by claiming that from the point of view of this critique, anti-Zionism, particularly if held by Jews, is the politics of liberating the Jewish people from the pincers of race. Thank you. Thanks, Jody. Actually, my, my paper is really questioning, is there anti-Semitism in the Palestine Solidarity Movement? I'd like to acknowledge that the land we stand on is the land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. The land was stolen and never ceded. Only a treaty can address this historic injustice, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present, and future. While my fellow panelist Peter Slezak has spoken of the spurious charges of anti-Semitism used to silence opposition to Israel, I will examine and address the extent to which real anti-Semitism may exist. First, let me deal with the term anti-Semitism. It is a European term for a European phenomenon, hatred and fear of Jews. It implies that Jews belong to an alien pseudo-race, like Arabs. They are framed as other to European civilization. To spell it hyphenated with the S in anti-Semitism spelled uppercase implies that there is a race of Semites, and this is spurious. The term Semitic can be legitimately applied to a group of languages, not to a supposed race. To hyphenate the word gives credence to the racist paradigm. Hence, anti-Semitism should be as one unhyphenated word. Uh, it is with some ambivalence that I address this question of anti-Semitism in the, in the solidarity movement. My hesitation arises from the attitude to, to it in the movement, often on a partially reasonable basis. And it's this hesitancy and ambivalent I wish to examine. After all, we are here to fight for the rights of the Palestinians. It's Jews in the form of the Zionist movement who have dispossessed the Palestinians. Not the Jews, but some Jews, even if for a relatively short historical period, most Jews. These Zionist Jews justify the crime of dispossession in the name of justice and historic and religious entitlement. And worldwide, the official Jewish leadership is dancing the military two-step with Israel, endorsing its every action, right or wrong. It can appear inappropriate to even raise the question of prejudice against Jews within our movement. So, why ask that at all? To effectively fight the false charges of anti-Semitism, which are used so ferociously against us, we need to be 
impeccable and challenging the genuine article. The mendacious charges of anti-Semitism against BDS and the Palestine Solidarity Movement by the Zionist lobby undermine the identification of the real thing. They have radically devalued the language. If we do not take our stand firmly on the basis of justice and universal human rights, we lose the ground on which we can effectively fight in support of the Palestinians. For the integrity of our movement, we need to fight all prejudices, including anti-Semitism. Just as we aim to deal with any examples of racism, sexism, and other exclusionary behavior or attitudes that arise, we must not be inhibited by our enemies from dealing appropriately with anti-Semitism, despite its complexities in our context. Palestinian leaders have been very clear about this, condemning and excluding such anti-Semites as Gilad Atzmon and Israel Shamir, curiously both Jewish. They know that their fight for justice is weakened by anti-Semitism and it does the Palestinian movement no service. Since in the movement we are so often accused of anti-Semitism, it makes sense to check out the extent it may manifest. We exist in a society which historically, where historically hatred of Jews has been deeply entrenched. In the wake of the horrors of the World War II, overt anti-Semitism has been very much on the nose. That is why the accusation of anti-Semitism is such an effective weapon for the lobby, Jewish lobby to silence, silencing criticism of Israel and Zionism. Clearly, at the present time, Muslims are the key focus of discontent and resentment. In Australia, of course, the historic dispossession of Aboriginal Australians underlies a huge well of racism against them here. Muslims have become the focus because of the wars the West is conducting against them across the world in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, and in Syria. Often they have the temerity to fight back. The activities of fundamentalists claiming authority from Islam to commit all kinds of atrocities have played their part also. The far right is rearing its very ugly head across the world. Along with extreme nationalisms and xenophobia, hardline Semitism is growing across the world. Even the security agencies in this country have named the far right as an emerging threat. Jeff Sparrow has shown in a recent article in Overland how News Limited allows some really shady outright anti-Semitic writers to hide behind more mainstream right-wingers like Mark Latham and Rowan Dean. For example, Moses Apostikatos, Apostatikos, a contributor to Dean's paper, the, the Spectator, has written an, an article, The Jewish Question, very quaint for those of us who remember how you know, the Jewish question was labelled as such, like the woman question. He says, among other things, God appointed the ascendants of Abraham to rule the known world. Synagogues have been bombed, Jewish cemeteries desecrated. While isolated, these incidents are not trivial. The Tsarist forgery, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, has very wide global circulation, despite its being exposed as fraudulent by the Times of London in 1921. It is noted in Wikipedia that the protocols of the meetings of the learned elders of Zion is an anti-Semitic fabricated text purporting to describe a Jewish plan for global domination. The forgery was first published in Russia in 1903, translated into multiple languages and disseminated internationally in the early part of the 20th century. According to the claims made by some of its publishers, the protocols are the minutes of a late 19th century meeting where Jewish leaders discussed the goal of global Jewish hegemony by subverting the morals of Gentiles and by controlling the press and the world's economies. Henry Ford funded printing of 500,000 copies that were distributed throughout the US in the 1920s. The Nazis sometimes used the protocols as propaganda against the Jews. The contemporary currency of the protocols is fueled by opposition to the Zionist project as well as classic anti-Semitism. For example, a young Jew of my acquaintance, a fervent anti-Zionist, totally innocent of history, was quoting the protocols as gospel. I put him right quick smart. I need to stress right up front that I've seen nothing of this hardline Semitism that Jeff Sparrow refers to in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. More prevalent in ordinary conversation in our movement and in the wider society is what I call common garden anti-Semitism. This is long-standing. There is a surprising amount of casual anti-Semitism about the wealth of Jews, about Jewish power, Jews controlling the world, and so on. 
it astonishes me how easily people can continue to express such negative stereotypes about Jews, how acceptable it is without social sanction. While there is a clear difference between common garden and hardline anti-Semitism, it is only one of degree. Indifference to the minor forms can lead to growth and acceptance of the other. Casual anti-Semitism creates a space for hardline anti-Semitism. The common garden stuff is like a weed that we must continually pluck out to avoid it taking over. In so far as these general social trends operate in our movements, we must be vigilant in noting them and eliminating them. Just because Islamophobia is centre stage and much more prevalent doesn't mean we should close our eyes to signs of anti-Semitism or be held back from confronting it by the ambivalence I have noted. We need to be alert but not alarmed. We must be aware and not guilt-tripped into silence when it is expressed. Anti-Semitism must not be an exception because of its complexity in the context of Palestine. Both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are hatreds which grow from the same ugly roots and they feed each other. The poison spewed by the likes of Moses Apostaticus is traditional hardline anti-Semitism lurking in the wings but gaining a foothold in the mainstream alongside Islamophobia and xenophobia. Its actual existence, even if currently at the margins, demonstrates its deep roots in European culture. It sits there waiting to emerge at times, like now, when people are attacked on all sides by uncertainty, injustice, and rising inequality. Anti-Semites characterize Jews as some kind of alien threatening incubus at the heart of European civilization that must be identified and expelled. In the same way, the phenomenon of anti-Semitism itself, along with other racisms, sits as a toxic incubus in our culture with its Christian imperialist roots with the potential to undermine our fight for justice and human rights. We can best challenge the spurious charges of anti-Semitism if we challenge its real manifestations in our movement. All racism is the classic misdirection of resentment and anger for wrongs suffered. To allow racism of whatever variety to pass unchallenged is to deflect understanding and passion for action from the real causes of oppression. Then these must be the undivided targets of our work. We need to be clear about the real objects if we are not to waste and dissipate our energies in futile directions and not focused on the real causes. Anti-Semitism is a peculiar kind of racism. It targets a group for supposedly being privileged and powerful. Because the left opposes pr the privileged and that powerful, it's easy even for people on the left, confused by these stereotypes entrenched in European culture, to direct antagonism to this ethnic group instead of the class that really holds privilege, wealth, and power. Even Marx was not immune. That is why August Babel, Babel called anti-Semitism the socialism of fools. And the ambivalence about calling out anti-Semitism has even a stronger basis in our movement because it is a Jewish nationalist movement, Zionism, that is the direct historical cause of the injustices we fight. As uh, Rebecca Vilcomerson of Jewish Voice for Peace says, the challenge is how to disentangle the actual anti-Semitism that still exists in the world with the way that accusations of anti-Semitism are used to suppress the conversation on Palestinian rights and how to talk productively about anti-Semitism when so often the accusation of anti-Semitism is used as a cudgel to repress substantive discussion. Pamela Butler says, because of the misuse of the charge of anti-Semitism, who will believe the charge when it is used to name and oppose rising forms of fascism or actual ideologies bound up with its actual toxicity? Our task is very much complicated by the fact that anti-Zionism Zionism and anti-Semitism are declared to be the same by our opponents. No matter how often we say we oppose the historic and current crimes of Zionism, not Jews or Judaism, they declare us to be anti-Semites. So we must simply uphold and pursue our goal of justice and rights for Palestinians and not be defensive. There is an ironic symmetry between the tactics of the Israeli lobby, anti-Semites and Islamophobes. Islamophobes declare that Islamist terrorist movements like ISIS are intrinsic to all in Islam. Anti-Semites declare that Zionism is intrinsic to Jews and Judaism. And the Israeli lobby agrees with them. So we must be very clear on the distinction between Zionism, Judaism, and Jewish identity. Help, history is helping us with this. As younger Jews, generations of Jews, especially in the US, but here in Australia also, are increasingly distancing themselves from Israel as a ground of their Jewish identity. 
Support of Israel just doesn't match their liberal values. They are more able than their elders to detach themselves from Israel as a guarantee of its existential security. I have a number of experiences of calling out anti-Semitism in the solidarity movement that I have encountered. Often enough, I let it go. But when it seems useful, I try to deal with it. Once, when I was speaking at a pro-Palestine rally, someone called out, the Jews control the media. I responded simply that I hadn't noticed that Murdoch and Packer were Jewish. The, po the point is to notice examples of anti-Semitism, expose them when appropriate. We don't have to make a moralistic finger-pointing song and dance about it. Other more, another more serious example was at a Palestinian solidarity event a few years ago. While people were arriving before the start of the event, an audiovisual compilation was being projected onto a screen. This was identifying the percentage of Jews in publishing and education and finance, etc. It was the classic anti-Semitic trope of the hidden power of Jews pulling the strings, controlling the world. I felt sick to my stomach. I wanted to walk out. But I thought, no, that wouldn't be constructive. I would need to deal with this. So when there was an opportunity, I, I took the microphone. I pointed out how classically anti-Semitic this presentation was. I didn't do a censorious song and dance about it. I focused on how it made me feel, uh, the I statements they teach you in communications courses. I pointed out the indivisibility of human rights and that racism of any kind had no place in our movement. My intervention was generally well received, but I wish it hadn't been left to me to, to do it. In fact, one seasoned activist, not Palestinian or Arab, said they, equals the organizer of the event, didn't really understand, i.e. she was implying that I shouldn't let it go. I found that pretty condescending, and anyway, insofar as people may not understand, it's even more important to clarify the issue. It is just letting pass these manifestations of anti-Semitism that I'm challenging. My friend's admonishment arose from that ambivalence about dealing with anti-Semitism that I started out with. In a sense, lack of awareness of anti-Semitism is understandable among those whose history is not European. We have different histories in our movement. Those of us of European background know about this stuff, Jewish and non-Jewish alike. We know about the long, dark shadows of anti-Semitism. Others may not. All the reason for all of us, especially of European background, to take responsibility for calling it out. And the task should not be left to those of us who are Jewish. Just as other targeted groups feel isolated and abandoned if they are the objects of prejudice and vilication, so do we if we find no allies. Another example that caused considerable controversy was the cartoon by Glenn Lievre in the Sydney Morning Herald in July 2014 of, during the onslaught on Gaza. It showed a yamaka wearing man in an armchair with the Star of David on the back. Um, I'll pass it around in a moment. On a cliff top, TV remote in hand, watching the bombing of Gaza. Massacre is entertainment, as armchair TV spectacle. It, was a very, it is a very strong cartoon. It accurately reflected a number of actual published photos of Israelis watching and evidently enjoying from afar the slaughter in Gaza. However, the face of the man was drawn as a heavily anti-Semitic stereotype. It was worthy of the vile efforts in the Nazi propaganda paper, Die Sturma. The identifying features, the Yamulka, the Star of David, were purely Jewish religious, not national Israeli. Had the man been shown with an Israeli fag and other national identifiers, there would be no problem with a cartoon. There was a huge roar of uproar of protest as, at the cartoon from the usual suspects. The Herald apologised, said they made a serious error of judgment and it was wrong to publish the cartoon in its original form. Yet here's the rub. The State of Israel has appropriated the religious Star of David on its national flag. It is a national symbol of Israel as well as a faith. The Zionist movement claims to speak for all Jews, claims that Israel is the land of all Jews, and the propagandists for, all, for Israel call all criticism of Israel anti-Semitic. Given that they believe that Israel belongs to all Jews and all Jews have an alienable right to the land, there is a kind of logic in calling it anti-Semitic. The error, error lies in the spurious illusion of Jewish identity with Zionism. Primary responsibility for that lies with the Zionist movement. A number of the reports in the, on the controversy put the word anti-Semitic in quotes, as if the characterization of Lelievre's cartoon as anti-Semitic was open to question, when clearly on the basis of the facial features it was not. I'll hand it round while I'm speaking.
the cartoon was accompanied by an equally strong article by Mike Carlson attacking the horrors of the attack on Gaza. There was not a trace of anti-Semitism in it, yet he was as much a target for the attacks of the lobby as its allies as, and its allies as we have as cartoon. There is a parallel with many of the cartoons of, Mar of Margaret Thatcher. Her regime, too, deserved and received ferociously satirical cartoons. Some of it was very misogynist. Sexism was used to attack Thatcher's unjust policies, just as Lievre's cartoon used anti-Semitism to comment on Israel's savage attack on Gaza. It is totally unacceptable to use any form of hatred to expose and oppose any kind of injustice. So we must affirm equality and human dignity in our movement. So we need to be clear about challenging each, ourselves and each other when, as inevitable, we will from time to time manifest the exclusionary behaviour we are fighting against in the wider society. While originating in Christian Europe, it was ironically spread to the anti-Zionist world in response to Zionism. Despite the challenges and complexity of the situation of anti-Semitism in the movements, let us not shrink from exposing and confront it. Let us do it appropriately, constructively, but let us not harbour it. Thank you.